Join with me in prayer, please. Father God, we thank you so much for your goodness. You're so good to us today, and you show it to us in so many ways. But God, we thank you especially for your goodness in giving us your word. And we pray this morning that you would speak to us through your word, God. God, please remind us all that your word is perfect. Your word is authoritative. God, let us dwell on that and celebrate it. But God, I pray that you remind everyone here, me especially, that I am not perfect and what I say is not always authoritative. So Father God, I pray that if I say anything wrong, anything not in accordance with your word, then by the work of your spirit working in this community, by each person here reading your word for themselves, that my error would be addressed, that I would repent of it, and that this community of Shorter University would move forward in purity of doctrine, that we may love you more and serve you better. We love you, God, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's so good to be here with you. I want to I thank and commend the chorale and Dr. Jacobus for a wonderful rendition of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That's a hymn that was originally written by Martin Luther and one that continues to bless the church and believers today. It's a, a hymn that my family and I have been singing in our family worship time. Uh, though I will give you guys a hint, if you're ever leading toddlers in family worship and you're singing that song, it's not a good idea to end on the first verse. And we found this out the hard way because we were going to bed and we sang this at the end of our family worship time. And so we sang the last verse, which ends with, For still our ancient foe, that's Satan, doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not as equal. So I told my kids, the devil is out to get you. Good night, sleep well. We found that it's best to go ahead and sing that second verse, which ends with a celebration that God has sent the God-man, Jesus, and that we will win the battle because He fights for us. His name is the Lord of Armies. That's a much better thing to sleep on. Some of you are here and you're asking, why are we celebrating the Reformation? You may not be aware of the fact that the Reformation has profound impact on our church and on our culture. Some of us might have missed the fact that the Protestant Reformation happened in the first place, and if so, that's, that's okay. But I want to challenge you to understand the importance of this movement, the importance of these ideas that were developed by men and women of God 500 years ago and following. I want to challenge you to understand that almost everything that you experience about church and about God in your culture has been shaped because of this movement. And I want to challenge you today to understand that much of this shaping has been done based on the authority of the Word of God. I want to challenge you to consider three ideas central to the Reformation this morning. Three ideas that these men that we now call the Reformers talk about. And, and three ideas that they are going to proclaim to the world. Three ideas that change the world. Three phrases that we often now express in Latin. And I think we'll find that this little bit of Latin will go a long way to understanding the Bible. And understanding how we should interact with God. Three phrases for you. The first is sola scriptura. This simply means Scripture alone. The second, sola gratia, meaning grace alone. The kindness of God that we do not deserve alone. And then lastly, I want us to consider sola fide, faith alone. Faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. So let's consider together what these things mean. Let's delve into these three ideas that change the world. And let's look at how these things are echoed in the Word of God. First, Sola Scriptura. You might have asked yourself before, why is it that whenever preachers like me come before you to preach, we are always so insistent about preaching out of the Bible? I don't know if you know this. You will know it if you take our Old Testament and New Testament survey classes. But the Bible is a pretty old book. At least 2,000 years old for everything that is written in it. Why is it that preachers are so insistent about coming and preaching to you and teaching you messages from this book that is thousands of years old? Surely we could come and talk to you about some good life lessons from Harry Potter. There's a lot there. That's a fun book. Maybe we could even do something that preachers like to preach against. And we could, you know, watch TV. Not, not just any TV, but TV that other people actually watch. What would be so wrong about coming to you and talking to you about how Game of Thrones can affect your life? The reality is, is that the reason preachers come to you and proclaim the Word of God from Scripture to you is because this is an idea that comes from the Protestant Reformation. 
I want you to consider what Scripture was like in Martin Luther's day. And I want you to know first and foremost that Scripture before Luther was certainly important. The church before Luther is using Scripture. They're proclaiming Scripture. But they're using Scripture in a certain sense. Scripture has been primarily relegated to use in liturgy, use in homily, and it's always, always being interpreted by the religious elites. This means that you don't read Scripture for yourself. You hear Scripture read often and most of the time in a language, Latin, that you do not know. And then your priest tells you what it means. And if he does not know what it means, he has to go up the ladder to his bishop. And if the bishop doesn't know what it means, he has to go up the ladder all the way to the Pope. One man counted upon to be the infallible interpreter of Scripture. So Scripture is important both for religious leaders as well as for the people. But the people do not in general know what Scripture says, much less what it means. So there is a man who comes about in the late 1400s and early 1500s named Martin Luther. Martin Luther, as we will see as we go through this sermon together, is, is very concerned on the state of his soul and feels a deep need to know more about God and, and understands his calling to teach others about God. So Martin Luther takes a post in a little cow town called Wittenberg at a little liberal arts college. And in this small college in a, in a German frontier town, he begins to do a dangerous thing. Martin Luther has the dangerous idea that perhaps he should read the Bible and teach the Bible to his students and challenge them to understand the Bible, not based on the authority of the religious elites of his day, but instead that he should subject the teachings of the church and the, the teachings of the religious elites to Scripture itself. In other words, what sparks a reformation with Martin Luther is that Martin Luther says, let me take everything that I've heard about God, everything that I've heard about how I ought to please God, and let me filter it first through the teaching of Scripture. So Martin Luther says, let's go to the Bible and let's understand the Bible as the authority. This is a dangerous endeavor. And it continues to be a dangerous endeavor in our day. I do not at all want us to think that we are exempt from false ideas about the Bible or about where doctrine comes from in our setting. In our setting, we have many false ideas about the Bible. I don't think that we often struggle with, with thinking that the Bible is only to be interpreted by religious elites. Perhaps this is something that some people struggle with. But I think in our day... We have a different method for interpreting the Bible. It's a method that if Luther and the Reformers cry, sola scriptura, we might in our culture cry, sola feels. In other words, how do I feel about Scripture? See, we've rejected that there are authoritative interpreters above us. And that's not altogether a bad rejection. But what we have done is we have substituted this for saying, I am the authority to interpret Scripture. If you want proof of this, just think about times that you've heard people talk about the Bible. Or maybe you've talked about the Bible yourself and you've read the text of the Bible and you've said, you know something? This, I, I feel like this means or this makes me feel this way. And then your entire interpretation of Scripture has been based not on the larger argument of Scripture, not on what the Bible is actually saying, but about how you feel about the Bible about how you feel about what the Bible is saying. Our society continues to hold the Bible as important. But our society, and I don't just mean our society out there, I mean our church society, the churches that you and I attend, and our religious leaders need to have a return to understanding the Bible based not upon how we feel about the Bible, nor how our culture tells us we ought to feel about the Bible, but instead, we need a return to understanding the Bible on its own terms. Understanding the Bible on its own authority. And so as we prepare to enter into the text today, I have a dangerous invitation for you. And that is you and I this morning would look into the Bible and that we would read the Bible and that we would accept the Bible on its own authority. But please be warned, for Dr. Luther and his students, this was a dangerous proposition. They faced the scorn of religious elites. They faced the scorn of their society. They faced the scorn of their culture. And I want to let you know before we begin this journey that if you accept the Bible on its own terms, it is very likely that you will face similar trials. 
You'll face the scorn of society and the scorn of your culture. But you will find something so much better. God may use your reading the Bible in such a way to turn the world upside down. He may use it to start and to continue a reformation. So let's look together at the Word of God. We're going to be reading from Paul's letters to the, letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. At this point in the letter of the Ephesians, Paul has already said much about what it means to be a Christian. And he has lifted God up as the one who sets Christians apart. But here in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 10, we are going to find... We are going to find that Paul lays out what it is to believe in the Gospel. What it is to believe in Jesus. And if we approach this from the understanding that Scripture alone is our authority, then we are going to find that grace alone saves us and faith alone is the means by which we obtain that grace. So if you will, begin reading with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them." God, may you bless the reading of your word this morning, and may it dwell in us richly. Let me show you what this passage is calling us to. It's calling us to pay attention to two major themes, themes that are going to be picked up and echoes, echoed by the Reformation. First is the truth that grace alone brings us to God. Let me tell you what grace means. Grace is a theological term, but grace is a simple term. It means a kindness that we do not deserve. So all we say when we say that God saves by grace alone is that in saving us, God extends us a kindness which we do not deserve. This may sound like a happy truth, and let me tell you that it is a happy truth. But before we get to grace alone saving, to understanding that, we have to go through three verses of Ephesians that before it tells us about God's grace, it first confronts us with our sin. We might say, well, Corey, why don't we just skip those verses? I mean, if those verses are unhappy verses, why don't we just jump straight ahead to verses 4 through 10 in Ephesians chapter 2? After all, you can take verses 4 through 10, pull out any one verse, stick it on a coffee mug, you can sell it all day in a Christian bookstore. I mean, these these are great verses. But we're not going to really understand how great unless we first go through verses 1 through 3. So join with me in looking first and foremost to understand grace. If what this passage says about our sin, why do we need grace in the first place? Why do we need grace? saving. First of all, this passage confronts us with the fact that we are all sinners at the beginning of our story. That's just there in chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So our stories begin not with us being some type of morally neutral being. Our stories do not begin with us being basically good people. Our stories begin with us being sinners who are in need of God's salvation and in need of the grace of God. That's how they begin. That's how they continue. Each and every one of us today sits here in need of God's grace. We are, by nature, bad people. If you want proof of this, I want you to come meet two of the most adorable people in the world. I want you to meet my two little girls, okay? My four-year-old is about this tall. My two-year-old is about this tall. They are wonderful. They are curly-headed. They are cute. They are smart. They will charm you. But they are sinners. And if you don't believe me, come live with them. All right? I never taught my girls to hit one another, but they figured it out. I never taught my girls to lie to me, but they figured it out. That's the nature that we have. We're sinners by nature. That's the way that we all are. We like to say that we are basically good. And that might be the case if we're defining good based on how I perceive other people. Many of you here, many of you who are my colleagues and my students, 
I know you. And yes, if I compare you to myself, not only do you seem good, you seem great. You seem far better than someone like me. But you're not comparing yourself to me. And I ought not to be comparing goodness based on my standard. We are sinners. And if we're going to stand on the authority of Scripture alone, then we have to understand that the Word of God makes this clear. But not only that, let's look at chapter 2, verse 2. We are dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Now, you might have a translation that fleshes that out for you a little bit. It says not just the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, but the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. The point of this is, is sin is not just a passive thing. We are not just sinful because we live in a sinful world. We're not just sinners because we're sinful people. You and I are sinners because we do acts of sin. We participate in sinful acts. And the Bible makes this clear. So we are not basically good people. We didn't just happen to be born in a bad place. This place is a bad place because we're the bad people who are in it. Go forward from that though. Look at verse, the second part of verse 2. We are, we are dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience. We don't just live in a, we aren't just bad people. We are living in a bad place. And if you look at this, if you look at this and flesh out what Paul is saying here in his letter, what God is saying through Paul's letter is that we are bad people living in a bad place among a bad generation. It's not just that, the, it's not just that we're sinners. It's not just that the world is a bad place. The world that we live in and the generation that we live in is bad. It's not bad because of terrorism, domestic or abroad. It's not bad because of politicians, Democrat or Republican. It's not evil because of health care. It's not evil because of welfare. It's not evil because of gun control. It's not evil because of violence. No, it is evil because we live in a world and in generations full of sinners like you and I. And if you want to stand on the authority of Scripture, you have to affirm this. This doesn't matter if you're a professor or a student. It doesn't matter if you're, a generation, or if you're a member of the greatest generation or of the busters or of the boomers or the Gen Xers or the millennials or whatever in the world we find out to call the next generation coming behind us. We are sinners living in a sinful world and members of a sinful generation. And it's not because of the people out there. It's because people like you and me live in this world and live in our generations. We are the ones that make it sinful. And then finally, in our sin, we are under the wrath of God. Look at verse 3 among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What does that mean? It means not only are we sinners, not only have we done something bad, but that sin bears the wrath of God. That means God is angry at sin. And you and I are sinners. And this is what causes the problem. We are sinners that stand under the judgment of God. And just in case you think that this is mean old Professor Barnes or mean old Paul, let me tell you about what a guy named Jesus says about the wrath of God. After John 3.16, that verse that we all know so well, later in that conversation, Jesus reminds Nicodemus that whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So if we're going to understand grace, we have to first understand sin. Why is that? One of the later reformers, a guy named Martin Bucer, who was a student of Luther and is later going to take Reformation ideology to Britain. Martin Bucer, in a commentary on this passage, says this. He says, no one appreciates the medicine properly until he fully understands the seriousness of the disease. In other words, why is it that Paul starts talking about grace by talking about sin? Why am I talking to talk about grace alone by talking about sin? Because we won't understand grace if we don't understand sin. I've been reading a, a book recently by a guy named Frederick Beekner. Frederick Beekner understands that if you want to understand the gospel as a comedy, meaning that it has a good ending, better yet, if you want to understand the gospel as a fairy tale, meaning not that it's not real, but that the gospel gives us an impossible situation than we would have thought before, you have to first understand the gospel as tragedy. Beekner says that before the gospel can clothe us, it must strip us naked. So for us to understand grace alone, 
you must first understand, you and I have a problem. We're sinners. We stand under the wrath of God. You and I are in need of something. And we need to cry out, how can we be saved? And the answer in Scripture, echoed by the Reformers, is by grace alone. What was Luther's radical understanding of grace? Luther was reacting against an understanding of grace from the church in his day that's all too often echoed from churches by all denominations in our day. And that is the understanding that it is somehow the church that extends grace. The church that extends the salvation that we need from the sin problem that we have. The church in Luther's day has come up with two, two unique understandings of this. One is that God's grace removes sin from people but does not fully remove punishment from people. That righteous acts are necessary to remove punishment. And if you have not committed enough righteous acts to remove your punishment upon death, rather than going on into paradise, you have to go to a place called purgatory. A place for people forgiven of their guilt, but who have not fulfilled their punishment. And in purgatory, these people are going to languish and suffer until they have been punished for their sins. But don't worry, there's a way out. The church in Luther's day has also come up with the idea that there can be these things sold called indulgences. In other words, holy men and women will pray for the souls of those who have died or the souls that will one day die and go to purgatory. And you can have them pray for you to get out of purgatory faster. Not not have to pay for the full amount of your sin. And you can do this by buying one of these indulgences. And when you buy an indulgence, you'll get a letter from the Catholic Church that is going to tell you that you have received so many days off of purgatory. These are used to build projects all over the world, but in particular in Luther's day, there is an indulgence being sold as a fundraiser for St. Peter's Basilica, which you can still see in Rome today. I want to make sure that we don't make a, a, a straw man out of Catholicism or the Catholic Church. If you read Catholic writers from Luther's day all up until today, you will find that there were many, many Catholics who were against this practice. But that doesn't change the fact that it, has become, it had become the dominant practice of the church. And the dominant understanding of how grace was given, how God would forgive sins, is that God would forgive through the church and then the individual is responsible for doing the rest. But Luther reads grace according to the Word of God. Look at Ephesians 2.4. Grammar is important, brothers and sisters. Learn it well while you're here at Shorter. The subject of these sentences change. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So up until this point, when Paul is writing to us in Ephesians, when we went through all of those dark parts about sin and sinfulness, we were the subject of all of those sentences. We had done all the sinning. We lived in an evil world. But God now is going to transform the story by extending grace. The first thing I want us to see here is that God saves sinners from wrath. And be aware in your day that it's just as easy to fall into the false teaching that the church or Christian things can save you from your sin as it was for people in Luther's day. Guys, listen, you do not receive any extra spiritual credit for being involved in churchy things. Mission trips do not attribute anything to your salvation. Showing up at church does not contribute to your salvation. Coming to a Christian college does not magically contribute to your salvation. And just in case you're wondering, for my students, I'm giving you extra credit for being here, but you do not get magic Jesus points for coming to chapel. No, grace alone. Grace alone. God's God's kindness that we don't deserve. This is what saves sinners from the wrath of God. Second, God doesn't just save us. God doesn't just flip a switch and say, go from being unsaved to saved. He does something far better than that according to Ephesians. It says in verse 6 that He raises us up with Him and seats us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show us the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness in Christ Jesus. So not only does God save us from our sin, not only does He remove the problem, but through grace, a kindness that we don't deserve, God gives us a, God gives us a better reward. He elevates us and, and puts us in the heavens. He makes us like Christ. Not that we will rule like Christ, but we will receive blessings that Christ has earned for Himself and for us. And then lastly, I want us to understand that God's grace transforms sinners into doers of good work. 
If coming to chapel doesn't get you any magic Jesus points, if going on mission trips doesn't get you any magic Jesus points, then why was it that a few weeks ago you stood here and heard so many of our students share about doing mission work in the summer and so many more stand at the end whenever we ask who has been on missions? We are blessed at Shorter to be a body of students who is serving Christ on the mission field, taking seriously the message that we see whenever we walk out the gates on the front circle. We're blessed in that. So why is it if that's not saving up for them some type of salvation, why is it that people are doing that? Now I hope you ask this question. I hope that your experience with Christians have been that Christians are doers of good work. If we're not doing it in order to earn God's favor, if He's already given it to us, then why do it in the first place? And the reason, guys, is that the entire point of grace is to take us from sinners to God worshipers, to take us from people who are condemned to people who are elevated with Christ, and to take us from people that we were told were walking in our transgressions and sins, and now make us into people who are walking in good works. So God's grace saves sinners from wrath, it glorifies sinners to become like Christ, and it transforms sinners into good works. And grace alone does this. Not your good works, nothing I can do, nothing the church can do, nothing the university can do. God's grace does this. Grace alone. So the question that you ought to ask now is so how do I get that grace? And you should ask this if you do not have it. With every breath that you have, it's deserving of all of the power of your mind. If God is giving away kindness that we don't deserve, how do we get it? In Luther's day, there's an understanding that grace is mediated through the church. And the church understands that in order to receive grace, it is to be received by faith. One of the reasons this has long been the teaching of the church is because we see it so clearly in Scripture. Look right here in in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So the church understands that this is supposed to be done through faith, but the church has interpreted this not as faith, as in believing in something, but faith is in faithful acts. This is, a very, this is an idea that translates so well for us as Americans. This sounds very good. God is giving away a gift, and how do we get it? Well, we perform faithful acts. We do something to, to earn God's favor. We pull ourselves up by our own spiritual bootstraps by performing faithful acts. So perhaps faithful acts don't save us, but faithful acts make us somehow worthy of this free gift, this undeserved kindness of God. And Luther tries this. Martin Luther tries every act of faithfulness that you can imagine. He tries all the ones you and I might think of. He confesses his sin. He attends church. He becomes a monk. He leaves behind marriage. He leaves behind an opportunity to participate in a promising family business. He does all of this because he wants to, he wants to show himself faithful. Then he goes beyond that. He says, maybe I need to subject my body to suffering. So he sleeps outside in the snow. He punishes his body. He fasts. He prays day and night. And he finds himself a tortured soul with no confidence in his salvation. But then he starts that dangerous project of reading the Bible on the Bible's own authority. And one day he reads in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the righteous shall live by faith. And it clicks for Luther. And he says this, There I begin to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the Gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith as it is written. He who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise through open gates. So Luther is tormented. He knows grace is there. But he doesn't know how to get it until one day he sees it's faith in the work of God. I want us to understand three things about faith and then we'll be done. Faith alone. There's three misunderstandings that I think our culture has about faith. Two are very similar to in Luther's day, but one is unique. Our culture suffers. I believe our culture is plagued by a misinterpretation of a passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which says, Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things unseen. 
And I find it true that when I ask most students, most adults, most church members and non-church members, what is faith? They all answer, faith is believing in what you cannot see. I've never seen Bigfoot. Never. Believing in Bigfoot will do nothing to credit my faith. Believing in Bigfoot will not obtain the grace of God for me. I've never seen a ghost. Believing in ghosts will not obtain the grace of God. I will not receive the gift of God because believing in ghosts. Believing for the sake of believing. Believing in unseen things for the sake of believing in unseen things. Though elevated by our culture is of no value. Faith is not just a belief in something you can't see. Faith is a belief in a particular thing that you and I have not seen, but about which we have been told. This is the argument the author of Hebrews is making. This is what Paul means every time he talks about faith. And that is faith in the work of God. A specific work of God. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ by which the Bible teaches our sins were paid for. The kindness of God that we did not deserve was extended. And by believing on that, we receive the kindness of God. Paul sums it up beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3-4. He said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures. That's faith. Faith is not about you and I mustering the ability to believe in something we can't see. Faith is about the object of our faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. His life, death, burial, and resurrection. Let me tell you two other barriers to faith. Some of you are having a barrier to faith because much like people in Luther's day, much like Luther himself, you are concerned that you are not good enough for faith. That God cannot extend His kindness to you Because you are a sinner. You've done particular things that you do not believe God can forgive. And you understand that you're a bad person and a sinful person. And I've got good news for you. You are a bad person and a sinful person. And God has loved sinners like you and me anyway. If it weren't for that, none of us would come to Him. God loves sinners. God loves sinners and sent Jesus Christ to die for sinners. It's good news. If you do not think that you're good enough for God, no, God got you anyway. God is bringing you in anyway. He loves you anyway. Accept it. Have faith that Jesus died for you. But some of you think, some of you think that you do not need to express faith in Jesus because you are basically good. You are basically good and at the end of your days, God will look at all the good things you have done and all the bad things you have done and the good will tip the bad a little bit and you will be accepted from the the grace of God will be given to you because you are a little more good than you are a little more bad. I have good news for you. You are not good. You are bad. You are a sinner. And if you believe that the Bible alone is authority, this is not up for negotiation. But the good news is God loves sinners. And God, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, saves sinners. I know it on Scripture alone. It's given to us by grace alone, the kindness of God that we don't deserve alone, and it's received by faith alone. If you believe that Jesus has died for you and has been resurrected by God the Father, you get this gift. I want to close with a challenge. These are three principles that change the world. That's not up for argument. We're going to do a scholarly symposium in this building this coming Tuesday. We're going to show you many ways in which these ideas change the world. Not up for argument. But God, through grace alone, received by faith alone, revealed in Scripture alone, will change you through these doctrines. God is changing the world through these doctrines. And so my request of you, my challenge to you is right now, I want to challenge you, have you received God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ? And as we close in prayer, I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for those around you to that end. Father God, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You so much that it is our authority. Thank You so much that we do not have to be astray wondering what You have said to us. Father God, we thank You for Your grace. You give us a kindness that we don't deserve Even though we're sinners, You love us and You extend Your grace to us. And Father God, we thank You. We thank You for the work that You accomplish through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
And Father God, I pray, I pray right now that if we have not received Your grace through faith, then Your Spirit would move in us and You would bring us, God, into that faith. Father God, not just so that we can go from being sinners to some type of good person, but God, so that we can go from being doers of evil to doers of good work. People condemned forever to people elevated with Jesus. God, I also pray for the believers here at Shorter. Father God, right now, by Your Spirit, encourage them to have conversations with people who are not believers, who have not shown faith in Your Son, Jesus Christ. Encourage them to proclaim the message boldly based on the authority of Scripture. And may it ever be on their lips that You save by Your grace and that is received through faith in Your Son alone. Father God, we pray that You would change Shorter University through these truths. Continue to shape our identity through these truths. Change Rome, Georgia through these truths. Change our state and our nation through these truths. And Father God, may you glorify yourself by changing the world through these truths. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.